Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next session in BIM College. We are heading into our third session for today, for our third day of sessions. And we are with Bojuan Zhang. Bojuan will talk to us about how to build a source with splittable do funds. So uh, please carry on, Bojuan. Thank you. Yeah. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Boyan from Google Cloud Dataflow, and today I'm holding this session to talk about how to build Beam Source with Sublibo Dufan. We are going to cover several content here, so because we are going to dive into the details of building source, and I'm going to compare every aspect with the existing bounded source and unbounded source API with Sublibo Dufan API. So before we dive into the details, I will first talk about what is a bounded source and what is unbounded source. And then I will introduce a little bit more on what is Sublibo Dufa and why we want to use Sublibo Dufa. And then we dive into the details. And if we still have several time left, I will uh, introduce a little bit more on some uh, advanced usages we can do with a building source on top of Sublibo Dufa. So, uh, let's go to the first part. Uh, what is bounded source and unbounded source? Uh, before we introduce Sublibo Dufa APIs, we actually have, uh, uh, we already have the uh, bounded source and unbounded source API we offer to the uh, Beam authors to write their own source. And the uh, bounded source is for the authors who write the source to read from a finite set of data, and it's, uh, it's in a batch pipeline. Uh, for example, the file IO, radius IOs, they are the bounded source. Uh, for building bounded source, the most important things we really care about is the speed of the read. We always want the read happens as fast as we can. So uh, in that case, we usually want to have the more parallelisms when we do the reading. And there are several APIs related to the building bounded source. They, uh, the bounded source is the first one, and then we also need to create a bounded reader for, the, uh, for that. And then we go to the unbounded source. It's usually read from an infinite set of the data and in a streaming pipeline. So for example, the Kafka IO and the pop-up IOs, they are very popular uh, streaming IOs in the uh, streaming world. And the, the key points for the unbounded source is we always want to make sure that we are tracking the watermark, we are advancing the watermark correctly, and uh, we, we are able to perform the checkpoints correctly, and we also want to make sure that we are able to do the dream correctly. And the related APIs to the unbounded source is first you need to create an unbounded source a, a class, and then you need to create an unbounded reader, and you also need to create a checkpoint, a checkpoint mark to perform the checkpoint and to perform the uh, finalized checkpoint. So given that, let's switch to the uh, what is Sublibo Dufa. Uh, based on the naming, you can see that a simple Dufang has two parts. First, it's a Dufang, and then it's Sublitable. It's a Dufang means it has all the same syntax as a Dufang. So it's pretty simple and straightforward to the current Beam users. So you still can use start bundle, finish bundle, process element for your uh, Sublitable Dufang. Especially the process element is always the uh, major function body for your Sublitable Dufang. Uh, one point is that you cannot use the uh, user timers and user states in your Sublitable Dufa. Uh, it, it may not be hard to support it in Sublitable Dufa, but we decide not to do so. But in the future, if we get many feature requests on that, we definitely will support it. And given that it's a Dufa, it always have an input and, and the output. So for the Sublitable Dufa, you will provide an element, and during the execution time, we will spend the element uh, pair with the restriction. So the actual process element function will get a uh, element and restriction pair. And based on that, the process element function will, out, will emit the uh, records from that. So usually, when you're building a source, the element is always a metadata or a uh, source descriptor, which can uh, describe what kind of things you want to read. And the restriction usually describe the amount of the data come from that source descriptor. So for example, in Kafka, we use a topic partition as an element to describe we, uh, which, uh, which uh, topic and partition we want to read from. And for the restriction, we are using a offset range 
to describe the offset for each record. So for the initial one, we will use zero to infinity as the uh, restriction. And then yeah, what it mean, uh, what the uh, splitable means for the splitable do uh, Imagine that uh, we're reading from the data channel and we, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of like easy, we can split other data channel. So what that means, uh, let's say we have three elements to read and currently we, are, uh, we have read the first uh, two elements and we have the last one uh, left. So it's easy to perform a read between a second and to return the last element back to the runners. But the power of the splitable Dufan is we can also split inside, that, inside one element. So that means giving a element and a restriction pair, we are able to split the restriction. Then we will have the element with the first part of the restriction, and we will have the element with the rest of the restriction. And we can give back the second part of the restriction to the runners, and the runner will reschedule that part on another workers. So it's, uh, it's a very important part for this people to find, and we will look into this in details in the following slides. So let's look into the uh, code example. Uh, it's in Java and it describes a very simple uh, suitable do farm. So you can see for here, it's a do farm extend, uh, it's a uh, do farm, yeah. It's extend from a do farm uh, interface. And then it's a major uh, process element of function body. For here, you, uh, you get the element and here is a restriction tracker. For this tracker, it's a, uh, it's a tracker to tracking your uh, restriction. And you can give the uh, definition of the restriction tracker by use uh, a new restriction tracker. Uh, the reason why we not have here is because for offset range, we actually gave a default implementation to, uh, to get a new restriction tracker. So this is a major function body. It's basically get the current restriction from the restriction tracker and continuously output a record from that restriction. And here is the uh, initial restriction part which is from the very beginning for a given element, we want to have an initial restriction pair with that element. So if you implement the get initial restriction function, you will, uh, you will have the power to do so. So this is a very simple uh, code snippet to give you a sense of what is the do fun looks like in code way. And let's look into the execution part of the uh, suitable do fun. So when you uh, write the code like this one, how does the runner execute it? The runner will run an expansion of the suitable do fun into three steps. The first step is pair each element with the initial restriction. The initial restriction is defined here. And then after this one, the, uh, these steps will output a pair, a pair of the element and the restriction, and then go to the second step. The second step is split each restriction into several parts. So this one is by the split restriction interface. We will talk about it later in the uh, initial split specific. And after these steps, they, uh, it will output uh, many uh, pieces of the element and restriction pairs and go to the uh, function, uh, process element function body, which is defined as a process element. This process element function will take element and restriction pair as input and output any uh, records or any uh, data you want from your uh, source. And then when the checkpoint or split happens, uh, th this process element function will also give back the residuals, which is also in the element and restriction pair format. So this is how the uh, split for do fun get executed in the runner side. Given that we, uh, we already have the uh, existing source API, like, uh, like I introduced a little bit before, a bounded source and a bounded source, why we still want to introduce a new source framework in uh, Beam? So the first one is, is currently, so Bibble Dufan is able to provide parities to the current source APIs. So that means all, all you want, all you need from your uh, current uh, source APIs, you can rewrite everything in Bibble Dufan. And secondly, is Bibble Dufan is the only IO framework for portable execution. Uh, currently, we are the beam are under a uh, happy migration path from the old execution world to the portable execution. So that means in the new world, Splitable Dufan will be the only source API. And the third part is, as you may mention, that uh, in the old world we have bounded source for batch, when we have unbounded source for streaming. So that means 
if you are writing application, you're writing a source in uh, with unbounded or with bounded API, and one day you figure out that you want your source working in streaming as well, then you need to rewrite your whole source with unbounded source API. But Subable Jufa is a unified model for both batch and streaming. So that means as long as you offer one implementation within Subable Jufa, you are free to switch with uh, between batch and streaming. So it will be super easy and straightforward mo mo for most of the apps. And lastly, what is the most, uh, which is the most powerful point for Subable Jufa is, as I mentioned, that bounded source and unbounded source has to be the root node of the pipeline. But so Bible Jufa is a Jufa. It can be any node of the pipeline. So that means you are going to be able to have the source-like operations at the any positions of the pipeline. So let's imagine one application. If we uh, store our topic partitions in a big query table, and we and we want we want a pipeline kind of like reach from the big query table first and get the topic partition we want to reach from then we won't have the Kafka source to read from that topic partition and the image records. So the first one is size estimation. Uh, we usually, when we're reading from this source, we usually want to provide the size information to the runners. In batch, the, when the runners get the size information, runner uh, will be able to perform, uh, make, a, a, uh, make a split decision and that, that split decision will help us to do the dynamic split in the exec execution time. So we will have more parallelisms and our read will happen more fast. And in streaming, this sense estimation usually means we can give back, we, we can give the backlog information to the runners. When the runners get back, backlog information, run, uh, the runners able to scale up or scale, uh, scale down the worker pools. In that way, the streaming read will happen more uh, efficiently. So for the, uh, uh, given that we, uh, if you want to do the size estimation, the APIs you can use is in bounded source, is bounded reader get estimate size bytes. And the unbounded uh, source is unbounded reader get split backlog bytes. So if uh, so, that means if you are already familiar with the concept of bounded source and unbounded source, and you know that you want to have these two pieces get implemented, so that means when you switch to this uh, submissible so Jufa, you all uh, you want to implement the get size information, get size interface. So if you provide the get size uh, get size function, the uh, SDK set will uh, will query the size on the element and the re restriction pair. But it's also okay for you to not provide that function because SDK will also query the restriction tracker progress to get the size information. So let's into, look into the Kafka example which is a, a simple code snippet of how we do the size estimation. In the left side is a submissible Dufan code snippet, and on the right side is the unbounded, unbounded implementation. So you can see we first implemented the get size annotation, and then the given element is a uh, Kafka source descriptor, which I mentioned is always a topic and partition, and then we also have a, the current restriction. When the uh, function gets this two, it will look into the current uh, offset range and get the how many how many records we have output and how many records left behind, and then we will give the uh, average size. Uh, then we we actually keep the average record size in memory, and when we get all of the informations, we will return the average size multiplied by the element remaining. So that's the size information we give back. And in the unbounded region implementation, it actually does the similar things. It queries a backlog and give that backlog back to the runners. So if we, uh, uh, given that uh, we already implemented the code, how does the runner can know the uh, size and how this function gets invo uh, get invo invoked? So let's look into the expansion again. So as, uh, as I mentioned before, the Subbable Dufa will be expanded into several steps by the runners and the size estimation will be evoked in the split and the size rest restriction. So that means after you split your restriction into several pieces and before your output, the SDK harness will call the get size uh, function on the, split, uh, on the uh, element and restriction pair and then pair the size again with the element and restriction and output to the next steps. And every time you do the checkpoint or the split from the process size element and restriction, we will also call the get size on the element and restriction. And all of the information will be available for the runners. So given that 
after we uh, have the information back to the runners, how can the runner know the size? So what we do is by encoding and decoding. For each element restriction and a size pair, we are using a KV coder and a double coder to encode the values. And we know that KV coder and uh, double coders are well-known coders to both SDK and the runners. So that means when the uh, runners get the element restriction size pair, the uh, runners is able to use first the KV coder to decode the values into a uh, some, uh, something key and the uh, double value. And then again, use the double coders to decode that value again to get the size. So that's how the runners get size information. And then we go to the uh, initial split. Uh, initial split usually is the uh, first initial, uh, first parallelism that we can give to read from the source. It happens before the read actually happens. Uh, in, uh, it's especially important in, in streaming because we uh, don't have the dynamic split for streaming. So the initial split will give the, all of the parallelisms from the very beginning for the streaming pipeline. If you want to if you want to provide such abilities to your source in unbounded source and bounded source, it's a split. Uh, you can implement the split APIs to give that uh, parallelisms, and in sublable function, it's called a split restriction. So let's look into the code snippet. So as you can see, that we we also have the left side is the sublable function implementation and the right side is the unbounded source implementation. So let's do, look into the unbounded source one first. The Kafka IO will take a list of the topic partition as input and split that list into sublist and then dis distributed this uh, list of the topic partitions on different workers. So basically one shard of the Kafka IO will include a sublist of the topic partitions. And then let's switch to the uh, sublistable Dufan implementation. As you can see here, actually, we are not going to split the restriction. The reason is that the initial split happens on the different level for subable Dufa and unbounded source. For unbounded source, the initial split happens at the source back. But for subable Dufa, the initial split happens at the restriction level. So that means subable Dufa will give a more uh, fine grain uh, splitability uh, uh, level things. In Kafka IO, we already have each element, individual element, to be a single topic partition. So in this case, actually, we are having the same initial parallelisms as a unbounded or as an unbounded source. So we are not. So in this uh, design, we are not going to split a restriction into further uh, shards. After we implement this code, how does the uh, how does the uh, split restriction get invoked invoked by the SDK harness? So it's still through the uh, graph expansion. And after we do the initial uh, restriction, and it will go to the split and the size restriction, this step will, this step will invoke the uh, split restriction function and output all of the shards of it. And given that we already split the restriction, how does the uh, runner to redistribute these shards on the different workers? The answer is, the runner will insert a reshuffle between the size and the split restriction and the next process steps. So the reshuffle will help us to redistribute the shards uh, evenly, ideally, evenly on these uh, workers. And then we will go to the execution step, which is really read from the source description and output um, record. So during the uh, actual uh, reading steps, we always want to provide the progress information back to the runners. The progress usually uh, includes two parts, how, many, uh, how, ma how much work has been done and how much work is remaining. And this information is important for the runners. Uh, there are several aspects. So first one, the runners can share progress information on the UI. Then the end users can know uh, which read step is slow and which step is fast. It will be helpful for the users to tune their pipelines to gain a better performance. And they even can change their source configurations to have a better read experience. And more importantly, the progress is a very important signal for the runners to make a split decision. So if you want to uh, get benefit from the dynamic split, you want to provide a good progress. And uh, how, do, how can we do that? In the bounded source, uh, the API is 
bounded reader get fraction consumed. So the fraction consumed will describe how much work has been done. So we can use one minus uh, such fraction to get how much work is remaining. And in unbounded source, actually, we only care about the backlog because it's a streaming pipeline and we only focus on how much work are uh, left behind. So the API is get split backlog bytes. And in Sublable Dufon, you can always uh, implement a head progress for your restriction tracker, and that will give the uh, progress information for the uh, runners. So let's look into the code snippet. In the left side, I'm demonstrating a uh, restriction tracker, a part of the restriction tracker that we used for the Kafka IO, which is called global offset uh, range tracker. In this function, the function will give the uh, progress information, which is contains two parts, as I mentioned, the work uh, has been done and the work is remaining. And on the uh, right side is the uh, existing unbounded source implementation. And you can see it's query the backlog and give back the backlog information. So after we do the implementation of the code like this, how can the runner and the SDK communicate, communicate with, each other, uh, with each other on this progress? So let's look into this execution graph. The SDK and the runners communicate with, with each other via a API channel, which is a uh, portable execution I mentioned before. And the right side, the blue box, uh, represents a uh, portable runners, and the left side represents the SDK harness. During the ex uh, execution time, the uh, portable runners will issue process bundle progress request periodically to the SDK harness. And there are, uh, there are many threads, and the two notable uh, threads in the SDK harness is one is the processing thread, which is calling your do from process element functions. And another thread will listen to this uh, request and do the corresponding actions. So when, they th uh, when this thread gets the request, it will call the current tracker get progress. And it will have the progress information from your tracker, and then use process bundle progress response send that information back to the runners. And the runners will look into the response and get the progress information it needs. So as you can see here, we are having two threads in parallel, and they both access to the same uh, object, the tracker, right? So you may worry about the uh, multi-thread safety concurrency issue. Uh, in current Java SDK implementation, we handle that for you. So in your implementation, there's no additional work need for you to, to provide such safety. So that's one thing we want to keep in mind. So as you can see, the whole point for this visible Tufa is have the interface and has the implementation as simple as possible and have the runners to do the heavy work. After we offer the progress, as I mentioned, the runner is able to issue a split. So let's go to the uh, dynamic split in batch. Dynamic split is a uh, powerful tools in batch to have the readers happen fast. So it usually split the current read into the primary, which the things we want to keep on the current workers, and the residuals, which is the things we want to return back to the runners, and have the runners which sketch on other workers. So uh, let's look into the execution, uh, the green execution graph. So here we can treat the green bar as a continuously read, and we are reading uh, this kind of shard in parallel, and as you mentioned, uh, and uh, you can notice that there are two very long green bar. And during this two very long green bar, other workers are idle. And we have to read for these two green bars to be finished. And it's not ideal, right? But with dynamic split, what we can do is the runner is able to notice that there are two very long outstanding work. And the runner is able to split these two work into other shards. and keep something in current work worker and the redistribute other works on the other workers. Then we will have this nice evenly redistributed works graph like this one. So we will have all the workers have the available work to do and we will have a faster rate. So it's an ideal world. In order to do so, we offer the APIs in bounded source is split at a fraction. The fraction is a double value that the uh, runners computed Based on, based on the uh, progress we provide to the runners. And uh, in the sublibble due file, it's restriction tracker tries to split at a certain fraction of remainder. And this uh, is the same. The fraction is also com computed by the runner. 
So let's look into uh, the execution graph. The reasons why I not put the code snippet here is uh, Kafka IO is a uh, streaming source. So we don't have the dynamic space there, but I will present the, uh, the, the same idea code when we talk about the streaming checkpoints. So the SDK harness and the runner harness, again, communicate with such a split by a portable execution, which is from API channel. And during the execution time, the uh, portable runners will compute a split decision and send this decision with process bundle split request to the SDK. And when the SDK gets such split decision, it will say, I want, I want the current tracker split at the uh, fractions that the runner provide, provides and send back the residuals with process bundle submit response to the, <coughs> to the runners. And the runner will look into the response and reschedule the residuals. And let's look into the uh, streaming checkpoint. Uh, I have mentioned that for batch we have dynamic split, but in streaming we are not going to do the uh, we are not going to do the dynamic split because the uh, read in streaming is infinite, and we are not uh, and we are not able to know the end of the uh, read, so it's not able to perform some split in the between. But we are able to do the checkpoint, which means we want the current read finish as soon as possible, and we will redistribute the, the residuals on the other workers. So you can uh, assume that when we do the checkpoint, the fraction remainder is always zero. And the APIs related to this functionality in unbounded source is unbounded source get a checkpoint mark. Uh, if you want to do this, you have to first to, to implement this function. And the second, you need to create a object which inherited from the checkpoint mark. But in Sublible to file, all you need to do is you implement the restriction tracker trace split. And in your function body, you can say I can. Uh, you can assume that the fraction of remainder is always zero. So let's look into the Kafka example. On the left side is a uh, partial uh, code of the global offset run tracker we used for the Kafka, and it it's implemented the trust split function. And for a given fraction of remainder, we query the current uh, possible end as the uh, as the things we estimate, and then we stop the current read immediately. And, re and return that uh, part of the residual residuals into the split result. And similarly, in the unbounded source implementation, you can see it actually put the nest offset as the uh, checkpoint mark and return it back to the runners. And this checkpoint will go through the same uh, split channels as I mentioned here. It will go through the same things as the dynamic split. So it will also go with the process bundle submit request and the, submit and the process bundle submit response. And if you are familiar with uh, unbounded source, you may want to say, after we do the uh, checkpoint, how do we do the similar things as we do in unbounded source for finalized checkpoints? So in unbounded source, uh, you, you usually do the finalized checkpoints by providing a function called Finalize check, uh, finalize checkpoint mark. And in uh, with Sublible Dufal, there are actually two major ways to do so. The first one is you can use bundle finalization. And the second one is uh, if bundle finalization doesn't work for you, you can you can build your own transforms to, do, uh, to perform such purpose. And the reason why we want to finalize checkpoint, checkpoint is Sometimes we may have the case kind of like after we commit all of the things, after we output all of the things to the runners and the runner is able to say, I'm done with the current bundle and I will, not, I will never replay this bundle again. In this case, we may want to tell the external source that I have done this portion and I want to commit such offset and you can clean up all of the things before this. So if, if you want to do this, this kind of things for a source, you may want to consider to do the finalized checkpoint. <clears throat> so let's look into the uh, examples. For Kafka IO, we actually built a transform to do so. So in this case, <coughs> sorry, in this case, you can see we expand current transform. We, we create a commit transform, and the expansions look like look like we will window the uh, output into a five minutes fixed window. <coughs> then we will do the uh, compute the largest offset per key, and then we will commit the offset back to the consumer. And in the unbounded um, source implementation, 
it all, it's almost does a similar things. It's always a uh, finalized current checkpoint, uh, which means it always commit the uh, current offsite to the consumer. And let's look into the bundle finalization way. So uh, this is a part of the version of pop Light IO, which use bundle finalization to commit offsite. So this is the, uh, the uh, supposable do from process element body. And you define a bundle finalizer here. This is a built-in mechanism for the SDK. And then you register your callbacks here. Then you have to down. So that means you can uh, you provide a notion says I want to use bundle finalization, and you re you register a uh, callback says this is a fun this is the things I want to do when I trying to do the finalization. So that's all the things. After you define this code, how can the SDK side communicate with the runner side to say I will perform such finalization? So again, it's over the uh, phone API channel. So here is the uh, execution graphs. When the runner start to send a process bundle request and uh, request and the SDK accept this request and spin the uh, graph and do the execution, the SDK will look into your, uh, your function and it will notice that you define a bundle finali finalizer and you, and you reject the callback. In this case, when this bundle finishes, the SDK set will send back a process bundle response with the request finalization equals two to the runners. When the runner gets this response back from the SDK, the runners will do a calculation, do some storage. And after the runners can consume that it will never replay this bundle again, it will send a finalized bundle request to the SDK. And when the SDK get this request, it will look into the callbacks you, re you reject here and then call the, uh, call the uh, callbacks to perform the finali finalization you defined and send back a finalized bundle response to the runner. So that's how the uh, fun finalization works. Uh, one point here is bundle finalization is always the best effort for the runners. So that means the runners can choose now to perform the bundle finalization. So that's why we build a, co a commit transform for Kafka because we know that's his best effort we may have a chance that the finalization will be never called. So, but in our case, we won't have the consumer to commit offset uh, all the time. So that's why we build a transform. So when you're building your source, you may want to make a judgment here. So if you think it's okay for you that several finalization will not be called, you can use the building finalization mechanism. But if you think it will bring your huge issue if you never call back, then you may want to build your own transforms. And, and then after we talk about uh, the full, uh, the, uh, all of the things here, I want to introduce a special things which is very unique to Spitable Dufan. So that means this self checkpoint functionality is only provided by the Spitable Dufan. The existing bounded source API and non bounded source API doesn't have the ability to do so. So what means self checkpoint? It means the Spitable Dufan is able to resume from the uh, is able to resume processing current element restriction and send back the residuals to the runners. And after a certain time, the runners will re reschedule, the resume, uh, reschedule the residuals and the SDK harness is able to resume from that checkpoint. So let's look into this uh, small graph here. So let's say our two phone are reading two elements, element restriction pair. So let's use Kafka as example, which is one topic partition uh, offset range and another topic uh, topic partition and another offset range. So in this case, uh, when we look into the first topic partition, we uh, there may be uh, no available record at this time. So if, without self checkpoint, we have to wait at that moment until something comes into this topic partition. But we know that the second element actually has several records. In this case, because we have to wait at the first element, we will never have the chance to read at the second element. So it's bad. But with self checkpoints, what we can do is we look into the first topic partition and we notice that there's no available record at this time. So we want to resume processing the current topic partition and we want to switch the next topic partition. So that's what the self checkpoint does. From the API's perspective, if you want to perform such 
functionalities, all you need to do is in your process element function body, you return the process continuation resume at the place where you want to do the self checkpoint. So let's look into uh, what we do for uh, Kafka IO. So this is a major function bodies for the Kafka IO. It's read from a target partition and output all of the available records. And as you can see here, we're trying to do one pull from the consumer and we check whether the current records are uh, empty. If the current records are empty, that means there's no available records from the current topic partition. Then we return resume, which means we want to resume processing current element restriction pair and we want to move to the next one. So it's very simple, right? So just you, you just need to make a decision and return the resume here. Then after we, re uh, after we do the self checkpoint, we return the residuals. How does the runner reschedule it? So let's look into this one. We will have the residuals as part of the process bundle response. And uh, so this is all done by the SDK harness. When you uh, write your process one like this one, and you produce certain uh, resume mark from your function body, the SDK harness will get to the notification and SDK harness will collect all of the residuals you produced from your space for Dufa and send it back all together with process bundle response. When the runner gets the process bundle response, it will look into whether there are residuals in this response and reschedule them. And how does the runner get this uh, get this uh, residuals? Like let's look into the protos definition for the process bundle response. The SDK harness will feed your uh, produced residuals in the uh, delayed bundle application format, which called the residual rules. So the runners will look into this field and get the residuals and send the residuals to other workers. So that's how the runners uh, reschedule this, uh, their things. And then let's talk about something specially to streaming. The first one is watermark, and I will also talk about uh, <coughs> I will also talk about the dream. In streaming, the source is the uh, producer for the watermark. So we always want to make sure that source are uh, tracking the watermark, advancing the watermark correctly. In Sublible Tufa, we offer a class called the watermark estimator for the uh, Sublible Tufa authors to tracking the watermark. We also provide three common types for the watermark estimator. The first one called wall time watermark estimator. So based on the time, uh, based on the name, you can know that the wall time will always use the uh, current processing time step as the watermark. And the second one is monotonically increasing. And this one will use the uh, record timestamp as the watermark. And it will always use the maximum value of the timestamp as the watermark. In this case, uh, the monotonically increasing watermark estimator expects that every time step it gets is increasing monotonically. If it is not, it will throw exceptions from the watermark estimator and your Dufan will be uh, killed. And the third one is the manual, wa manual watermark estimator. So based on the name, you can see that you can use this manual watermark estimator in your, in your process element function body and you can set the watermark by yourself uh, no matter what the value is, as long as it makes sense to you. And there are two parts in the uh, Subisable Dufa when you're trying to track the watermark. So the first one is you need to create a watermark estimator, as I mentioned here, and you need to tell the Subisable Dufa what kind, of sub, uh, what kind of watermark estimator you want to use. So that is new watermark estimator inf interface does. You, imp you implement this interface and give the type of the watermark you want to use. And the second part of the tracking watermark is to set the watermark in your process element function body. So let's look into the uh, create. So let's look into the uh, create watermark estimator first. But before that, let's look into the uh, how we how we track the watermark in the unbounded reader API first. So basically, that is in the unbounded source, we have a API called get watermark from the reader. And what the reader usually does is look into the every element, every record it's going to produce and get the uh, record timestamp as the watermark. And uh, let's look into the uh, Subitable Dufa implementation. So this is part of the uh, implementation which give back the watermark estimator. So as you can see, it implemented the new worker estimator interface 
and give the things it wants. For Kafka I.O., we actually are using two kind of watermark estimator. We use manual watermark estimator, and we also use the monotonically one. And then let's look into how we set the watermark for the water estimator. In this process element, uh, process element function body, we output the records. And when we know that currently we are using the manual watermark, watermark estimator, we will set the watermark for that. But if we know that currently we are using the monotonic one, all we need to do is we say we want to output with timestamp and we give the record and we give a timestamp. The, uh, the SDK harness will have your watermark estimator track that uh, output timestamp as a watermark. So in short, that means let's give, go back to here. So for these three common tabs, for what I'm and the monotonically increasing one, all you need to do is you, you implement the new watermark estimator interface. And to say, I want to use this two candle watermark estimator. And you make sure that every time you output a record, you also output it with a timestamp. That's all you need to have to do. But if you are using a manual one, you have to first give back the watermark, uh, watermark estimator tab. And the second, you want to set the watermark manually in your process element function body. So that's how we check the watermark in the uh, Supervisable Do Farm. So that's, and after we report the watermark, I mean, with the uh, watermark estimator, how can the runner get the information? So we usually report the watermark back with two kinds of things. The first is when the self checkpoint happens, we will report the watermark together with the process bundle response. And or if the uh, runner runner issue the checkpoint, which is streaming checkpoint happens, we will return the watermark information together with process bundle split response. And they are all in the same place, which is delayed bundle application field. And this delayed bundle application will contains a map of the watermark. Usually what the runner does is it will look into this field and get the minimum timestamp of all of the current watermarks as the watermark. So that's how it does and how it gets back to the runners. And then let's look into the drain. Uh, drain is kind of like special operations for data flow. And is a, it is a way that data flow offers to the uh, users to cancel their pipelines or to stop their pipelines. So usually if you want to stop your pipelines, there are two ways. You can cancel your pipelines directly, which means the pipelines will, will discard everything it's in flight and just, fini just fi uh, finish it as far as possible. And the second one is drain. So that means the pipeline, the source, will not produce any new records, but all the in-flight in data will be finished inside the pipelines and then stop it. Uh, before uh, within the bounded source, uh, within the unbounded source API, there's no way for the customers, for the uh, SDK users to customize the weights of, of drain. The unbounded source will just stop the read immediately. That's the default behavior. But for the suitable do fun, we offer the APIs for the uh, source authors to customize the behavior. So that's called truncate restriction. From the name, you can see the function is supposed to truncate an infinite restriction into a finite restriction. And the finite restriction should be able to finish. So this is how they, uh, when you write your, when you uh, write your source on top of Cebu Dufan, how can you configure the uh, dream behavior? But it's also for, but it's also okay for you to not implement the, the truncate restriction because we also provide the default implementation, which is uh, stop it as soon as possible, just like what we do for a Monday source. So after you define this function, how does this function get invoked by the uh, runners? So. This is another round of the graph, uh, graph expansion. So runner will do this kind of things while to do another round of it. So the left side is the normal process element steps. And <clears throat> it will keep processing until you click the button on the data flow UI that says, I want the pipelines to drain. After the runners get the signals of the drain, it will change this por portion of the graphs into this portion of the graphs which it will insert a truncated restriction steps right before the process says element and restriction. The truncated restriction will invoke your defined truncated restriction function, 
which cut the given, restri uh, given restriction into a finite one, and then populate into the process, process element again to have, it to have it finish processing. So that's how the uh, drain is performed on the split ball do far. So uh, I, I also want to talk a little bit more on the advanced usages. If you build your, your source on top of Subible Dufa, the first one is deduplication in streaming. So that means if you are writing a streaming source and you want to do the deduplication after you output the records, there's no additional work for you because we already built a uh, deduplication transform in the SDK side. All you need to do is you can assemble that transform into your pipeline. And the second part is the things that I really want to highlight is Subvisible Dufa is a Dufa. It can be any node pipeline. That means your source can be any node of the pipeline. It is no longer to be tied into the root node of the pipeline. So please keep that in your mind. And why that's very uh, important is because it will, it will give the more possibilities of the application scenarios. So for example, for Kafka, we build a dynamic grid functionalities. So what that means, when we with the bound, bounded source API, the uh, Kafka has to the Kafka I/O has to be know the partitions it's going to read from during the pipeline construction time. When it starts reading, if the Kafka topic want to do the repartition, it will lost the new partitions added into that topic. But now we have the dynamic rate, dynamic rate. What we can do is we always pulling from uh, pulling the available partitions from the topic and we emit the new added partitions down to the Subbable Dufan implementation of Kafka I.O. And that uh, Subbable Dufan can continuously read, the, read from the new added partitions and output the records. In this case, there's no need for the pipeline authors or the pipeline managers to restart the pipeline over and over again after repartitions. So it's super powerful. So please keep that in mind that your source can be any of the pipelines. And the third one is uh, with the, with the Subbable Dufan implementation, you can create cross-language tra cross transforms as long as you implement certain given interface. So that means if you write your source, for example, in Java SDK, then you are able to use your source from the Python pipeline. It's also very uh, powerful. So, so basically, that's all the things I want to talk about. And finally, I want to share this with you. So I list all of the interesting reading materials and all of the tutorials I have for the building source with Subable Dufan on these pages. So if you are interested to uh, if you are interested in learning more details or uh, reading more things, it's definitely the things to go. So yeah, that's uh, for my side. Let's go into the Q and A session. <laughs>